obviously his personalism was very different from this, but, but, but to sort of elevate the person um, connects it to this other sense of dignity and, and, and personal worth, which, which is ultimately individualistic and, and reductionistic uh, in, in ways that, uh, well, we can see everywhere. So uh, to the extent that uh, we can press our own case about what it, what it means um, and, and what the implications of this other view of are, I think, uh, are important. <coughs> Can yeah, I just, uh, I want to say a word in favor of the common good language. I do think it, it is often used by Catholics to express a, a kind of Catholic nostalgia for the good old days of, um, you know, well, basically a lot of our politics is driven by nostalgia for the post-war consensus, um, you know, uh, and, and that's, I think, often, I can get right about that. But I would say, put this one word in. I think a lot of, I think, the exaggerated individualism is very strong, and a lot of people just find it very difficult to get their minds around the fact that there are some goods we can only have in common. Um, I mean, the good of marriage is not something you can enjoy by yourself. So when you get divorced, you cannot parcel out, you can parcel out property, but you can't parcel out the good of marriage. We can't take Central Park and allocate it to the 8 million residents of New York City and still enjoy the good of the common good of, of the park. So once you start talking to people about that, then they begin to get sort of their minds around it. And it's actually quite helpful to people. I find it very helpful for folks to recognize, like, like, oh, geez, I guess there are some things I really have to link arms with people in order to, to, to create it and to enjoy it or to preserve it. I, have to, I can't get it unless I join with other people to create it. There are some things that only the political community can do. Like I think um, I, I live on the east side, and. You know, there's a big, huge vacant lot next to the United Nations. I cannot understand why the city doesn't use the law of eminent domain and make that into a park. Yeah, I mean, what's it going to cost? $100 million to buy the to property from the developer, maybe? I mean, you know, the budget for New York City is $85 billion a year, and you can't come up with $100 million to buy the property and make a park. Um, the rumor is it's radioactive. So, <laughs> part of the problem. That's, right. that's what we said at the UN. Yeah. <laughs> but you know the problem I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's right there on first just before. It's huge. They say okay. it's radioactive. Okay. Now they have some it. sort of Wi Fi set up. You won't need to put any lights in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe the light. So, I guess just right. really free. So, I feel like we've, uh, whether it's, you know, this disgusting Penn Station that we have that's. <laughs> You know, a subway station masquerading as a railroad station. You know, Jeff. You know, LaGuardia Airport. You know, we don't seem to be able as a society to sort of recognize that there are some things that we just can't. We can't have them unless we function. We function as a as a political unit together. I think it's useful for folks, especially on the right, to recognize that not all goods can be can be um, can be held by individuals as individual goods. No, I think these are all, especially the last question, or sorry, the last question and the answers in particular were helpful to kind of identify what we, what we can bring in the different mentality that we have, that we offer um, to society, especially in the political engagement. But now I'd be curious for questions, if there's anybody out there who would like to ask a question, uh, just go ahead and raise your hands and then we'll, we'll call on you. Speak loudly. Right here. Okay. And repeat and the question. And yeah, you, I'll repeat the question, no problem. Uh, Mr. Reno spoke of how the church has perhaps contributed to social disintegration through her emphasis on human rights. Uh, the, the Catholic uh, philosopher, Father Chavis uh, Pankers, I think that's his name, mm -hmm. spoke of the difference between freedom of indifference and freedom for excellence. Mm -hmm. And I think in a, in a sort of implicit way, our secular culture kind of appealed to, kind of appealed against freedom for indifference and the movement towards gay marriage because this kind of appeal of let's not be indifferent to this to the loneliness of mm -hmm. of homosexuals. So to think there's sort of a way that we can kind of we can kind of sort of appeal to that uh, kind of sort of appeal to that same ethos and say and kind of guilt the secular culture into not <laughs> into not into not being indifferent to, into not being indifferent about the disintegration of 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 the family. Well I do think that there's a pretty broad consensus about whether we can um, whether we can leverage uh, uh, people's concern, you know, recognition that there, there are things that we need to be free for. Uh, and I, like I said, I think that there's more to work with 
there is there is something to work with out there. Um, that, like I said, I think there is a broad consensus that um, uh, family structures have been weakened by many factors in our society. It's very harmful to um, uh, vulnerable people, especially children or people that are on the lower end of the social scale. Um, and I just think we need to uh, try to figure out how to be pro-marriage as broadly as possible without compromising our, our convictions, which I think can be done. I, I have written about, I think we should have divorce tax. I think we should tax divorce, just like we tax cigarettes. Um, in order to discourage or, uh, you know, it's a great irony that we have, we have unrestricted divorce in New York and Mayor Bloomberg back in the day wanted to restrict people's access to large uh, sodas. Um, so we have a consensus that we should try to prevent bad things from happening. Uh, we don't like the idea of being moralistic about it, and so we ta uh, tax. Um, That's moralistic. It's not moralistic. It has to do with the fact that we need to, society needs to be compensated for the social disutility created by divorce. Um, and I think I would make it um, uh, a fall only on wealthy people. So there would be, you know, you'd have to have a half million dollar net worth in order to be subject to 10% divorce tax. Fault divorce. Because I believe in, I don't believe in trickle down economics, but I do believe in trickle down culture. And I think that the way that our elites um, behave uh, sends a message to ordinary people about what, what is right and, and proper. Can we guilt, can we guilt people into uh, rejecting the dissolution of the important cultural values? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think there is a lot of consensus about family, and in, in some ways that's actually pushed the argument for same-sex marriage forward in, right. in a lot of ways, you know. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think it's very hard in our current environment to make that argument, but um, I think to the extent that it gets made, it'll, it'll get made uh, through what people see in the lives of increasingly Christians, not, not only Christians, but increasingly the, the people who get married and stay married and so forth will, will be them. Um, and this freedom for excellence uh, might uh, have a chance. Uh, I simply add, by way of totally disconnected observation, <laughs> Father Pink Harris was a guest at my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> He just happened to be in town, and one of the Dominicans who was a concelebrant said, I have a friend in town. Oh, I think he'd wonderful. enjoy coming to your wedding. Can he come? We said, sure, and it turned out to be Father Pink Harris. <laughs> in support of excellence. Yeah. <laughs> Please. You know, it's striking the range of American politicians who can identify as Catholic. <laughs> Do you think that, I mean, I suppose it's a strength and a weakness, the flexibility? The, the label of being a Catholic politician, you know, Joe Biden and his Pelosi and you know, Paul Ryan or Justice Scalia. Do you think it's more of a strength or more of a weakness? That flexibility. Does it become meaningless? That they I'm not sure what you mean by flexibility. What, so I'll just repeat, repeat the question. Yeah, oh, go ahead. No, please repeat it. The fact time. that Joe Biden can say, I'm, and sincerely believe he's a Catholic politician, just as Paul Ryan can say the same, while having very divergent views. Do you think that, that in fact they can both fall under the Catholic umbrella or take on the mantle of being Catholic is a strength? Or is that a weakness to the point of it means nothing to say you're a Catholic? I, I think it will repeat it just, just yeah. to be sure. No, I mean, the idea here, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that how is it possible to hold someone like Paul Ryan, who considers himself Catholic, and someone like Joe Biden, who also considers himself Catholic, on the same spectrum, right? Does that even make sense? And by having these two such opposite <coughs> poles, does it really mean anything at all to be Catholic, especially a Catholic politician? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll make a personal confession, since we're not exactly in the church basement, but <laughs> for the past 16, 18 years, I've been a recovering social scientist. Um, and when I was off the wagon, um, I had to read social science articles, voting studies and things like this. And um, I think the existence of the simultaneous existence, which some people might take to be a kind of violation of the principle of non-contradiction, the simultaneous existence of Joe Biden and Paul Ryan or whatever is, is simply a reflection of the fact that there is no Catholic political 
identity in the United States. Um, Catholics are divided in almost precisely the same way as the population at large is. And there's virtually nothing distinctive about Catholics as a kind of demographic or political group. And so I, I think that's, it was not so in the days of, uh, of Al Smith, whose bus is gracing the hallway out there, right. but it is now. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, is it a political weakness or strength? Uh, I mean, I don't know, but it certainly reflects the weakness of the church. Um, because, uh, you know, how, what, what kind of, how, it obviously doesn't form people very well if, if, if they can think that, that opposing same-sex marriage is a form of bigotry, as Biden does, or that um, our unlimited abortion regime, or voting against the partial birth abortion bill, bill um, could in any way be consistent with um, uh, with any kind of conformity to the teachings of the church, uh, yeah, that, that's that's a clear sign of the church's uh, weakness um, as an institution that forms people. Now, politically, it's probably a strength in the sense that uh, you you know you uh, you hedge your bets, right? Although it doesn't seem to have worked out very well for the church when it came to the contraceptive mandate. Um, so it's not clear that, yeah, um, I think it's a weakness. Yeah, I think it's just pretty much a weakness. Um, I don't think that, I would like to think that Biden would protect the church's religious liberty, but, um, but I'm not convinced that that would be the case. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that he and Pelosi and others would find Jesuitical reasons why um, in this case, they were doing what was actually in the best interest of the church um, by limiting the church's freedom to do, um, to, do, to, do the, to do bad to do bad things. Yeah. I want to butt in on this and just continue with the question because I think it's at the heart also of what we we were talking about before this entire time and helps us see it better. Perhaps I mean when you think of someone like Biden, at least from my perspective, both the Catholic and the maybe the liberal side, you see someone who's willing to compromise perhaps in the wrong sense, right? Someone who abandons the ideal. No, no, no. Compromise would be to say, I mean, in Germany they passed a, uh, uh, a doctor-assisted suicide law this year, and it was a compromise um, in the sense that, and there were Catholic politicians that voted for it because it involved requiring palliative care in all institutions and allowing for doctor-assisted suicide. It did not say that doctor assisted suicide was a right. It only permitted it. And so you as a Catholic politician were not saying that I, just as you could argue for the legalization of marijuana on the grounds that not that it's a good thing, not that people have a right, but that as a public official you recognize that the harms of criminalization are greater than the harms of, of legalization or legalization of prostitution and many other things. But that is not the position that Joe Biden takes. He thinks it's a right. Uh, to be it for a woman to have an abortion, or that it's a right for a man to be able to marry a man. And I think that it's part of the perversion of our political culture. I feel badly for some people on the left who feel backed into this by the, by the rhetoric of, uh, of liberalism, which turns so much on rights. Um, but it's very destructive, and it's not compromise um, at all. It's a, it's, it's, it's a complete capitulation and an assertion of the opposite. Yeah, but I mean, I would like to also point out the danger of someone like Ryan, right? Or someone who perhaps takes a more moralistic stance and someone who says there is no space for that freedom or that conversation, right? And so what I'm trying to say here is that perhaps this is a very good example of what we face and also a lack no, of wouldn't, education. But wouldn't the responsibility for someone like Biden or Pelosi is to actually, uh, to actually open up the possibility of the Democratic Party of there being a conversation about the prudence of... Uh, permitting abortion while rejecting uh, Roe v. Wade, uh, which is absolutely a position that is not accepted in the Democratic Party. There is not a single politician now in the Democratic Party, it seems, who is willing to say that Roe v. Wade is wrong, uh, morally wrong. Um, and uh, even if they say that, even though I, as a pragmatic politician, recognizing the need to balance goods, would permit, uh, would, would uh, compromise and restrict abortions, allow abortions up to the uh, end of the first trimester as they do in most European countries. But I mean, on this again, I would but press... That would say, I mean, a responsible Catholic politician on the, on, who, on the left would, 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 would try to 
begin that conversation about how to change the sort of all or nothing rhetoric of rights with respect to end of life, gay marriage, and, um, uh, but that, but I, like I said, that's, that's not, they don't do that. Yeah, but do we see that same flexibility on the right? Right, I mean, on the, on the, the moralistic, more, you know, this is what we believe, this is how we do it, and anybody who's not with us is against us mentality as well. With respect to? I'm saying it seems to me that on the side of Biden, you have the same mentality. Whoever's not with us is against us in terms of this rights-based approach, right? Because you're ultimately rejecting the freedom of the individual, and by the way, that freedom is sacrosanct and nothing can challenge it. To those who say, hey, you can't use your freedom in that way. Why? Well, because it's immoral. Right? right, so it seems like there's this problem. You know, I, I, I'm trying to say that it seems to be, to me, to be two sides of the same coin. The issue of evolved there. Well, but that's not true. Well, I mean, it seems to me that the Republican Party is permissible to say that uh, there can be exceptions for rape and incest. Okay, so almost all Republican politicians uh, hew that line because they recognize that um, the American public wants that ex exemption, and that's a compromise. Um, because that, that's not what the church teaches. Um, and it's also not, it doesn't make much moral sense. Um, so there is, that, there is that freedom on the part of a politician on the right in the Republican Party to um, make a limited, accept, li limited permissibility of abortion. And then, of course, if you, once you make that exemption, you, you can expand that. Um, one, and, I can, and that's one reason why to resist the exemption is because it can be expanded, but you know I do accept that it's the nature of politics that you have to you have to pursue you, the possible good. Um, one should always never let the perfect be an enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. Professor Rather, can we? Let's have another. I mean, I agree with with, uh, with everything was said. So let's. Oh, sure. <laughs> let's get, sure, sir, in the back. Thank you. This question is for Mr. Lewis. Um, you said you feel uncomfortable sometimes talking about sexual morality. Is one of those issues in sexual morality, contraception, do you find that difficult to explain to opponents of uh, Catholic teaching on contraception? Um, the times when I find myself in the position of having to execute that task are <laughs> thankfully relatively rare. <laughs> I do uh, teach a course on natural law, which um, whether one wants, thinks we shouldn't talk about it or not, I mean, all I mean by it in the end is what's rationally moral, but what, what, what we can say about what's morally right and wrong on the basis of reason, and whether we call it that or something else, I mean, I'd be different to the name. Um, but, um, so, I mean, marriage and sexuality is something I do talk about with uh, students and make rational arguments about that. I'm, I, I suppose I have to say I'm somewhat less embarrassed about that than I talk about other things. I mean, and I think, I mean, honestly, I think there probably are more students who, who who would be willing to listen to the church's teaching on contraception than they would be listening to listen to the position about same-sex marriage. Yeah, I mean, it's, true. It's, it's really, I mean, I, I was just been astonished at the quick uh, change of opinion among sort of Catholic undergraduate students, people between the ages of 18 and 20, who, mm -hmm. about that issue and about homosexual kind of rights in, in general, I mean, that, that, that's, it's, it's changed with remarkable speed. Um, so, um, but I mean, even, I mean, it just, when you sort of think about these issues, I mean, this is, it's a little unpleasant to contemplate, but I mean, I think, you know, I mean, even to sort of, if you sort of go to rock bottom, I mean, there are very few people who don't think, for example, sexual activity with animals or something is, is not wrong, I mean, at some level, but if, if you actually try to make an argument about that, again, and you sort of explain, well, here's why that's the case, and you make a very sort of precise kind of rational argument. I mean, it's, again, it's not as easy as it seems. And um, again, for most of human history, nobody needed to, <laughs> right? I mean, nobody ever thought it was anything. I mean, uh, but that, that we have to make such arguments now is you know, kind of where we are. But um, yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I think most people think of contraception as just sort of an easy, an easy question. But, but certainly among Catholic students, I mean, I think they're a lot more open to hearing about that than there are some other things. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, thank no. you. Uh, so uh, uh, Dr. Reno talked about uh, trickle-down culture. And uh, Dr. Lewis began by sort of dissing 
uh, metaphysics. <laughs> now, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, these, these people who think that metaphysics is the solution. Um, so I just I, them, not I, the metaphysics. Well, <laughs> I, I'm one of these people, so <laughs> okay. uh, I want to I want to sort of exploit something that you guys have talked about to defend metaphysics as maybe part of the solution. Um, so it it seems to me that that uh, one of the things you, you touched on was uh, that uh, reasoning arguments are not usually uh, the first way that people are convinced of ideas. Right? You don't win over people by making a, a syllogism when they're culturally predisposed to uh, like reject uh, your moral conclusions. Um, but uh, Dr. Reno talked about how uh, authority, law for instance, um, can create this sense of a moral imperative. For instance, people in my age group tend to think of cigarette smoking as a basic moral evil. You know, you start smoking, everyone gasps. Um, so that's, that's very interesting. There's an element of authority uh, imposing this sort of basic sense of nature on people. And I wonder if uh, both of you could talk about the role of the church in asserting authority um, and the way sometimes the absence of that clear authority over the past uh, few decades has led to a collapse in the sense of uh, nature and uh, maybe the, the, the natural role of the human person in political communities um, and sort of opened us up to individualism, this sort of extreme personalism that you talked about. Um, and, you know, people today are, are waiting, it seems, for a new pope who's going to suddenly be clear about everything, just bring down the law on people. Maybe I'm waiting for this. Um, and, you know, is there a point, should we be waiting for that? Uh, is it reasonable to expect that authority will, will sort of help solve these problems? Or are there other solutions to uh, these problems? Is there a way of inculcating a basic sense of human nature and natural political engagement uh, apart from waiting for the savior pope who's going to you know, reignite Christendom or something, something crazy like that? I'm very opposed to Savior Pope. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, Jesus is sufficient uh, as a Savior. Um, I do think that the crisis, one of the crises, or one of the what the anthropological heresy that John Paul II was rightly very concerned about, could be reframed or re reposed as um, as a. Uh, um, an increasing suspicion in the late modern era that all forms of authority are, are, are kind of m modes of domination and that authority is really at war with human dignity. And the kind of antinomian idea that if, if you lay down the law that you are, you are you're diminishing and you're compromising in many ways or you might even be destroying what really is the essence of human dignity which is our freedom um, that's very powerful. So, so, so this is what the church is. Such a difficult bind has been a difficult place in the last two generations. Uh, given the rise of that sentiment, the church's um, clarity of teaching actually winds up being received as, uh, or by some received as some as a kind of um, stultifying, crushing thing. And so, there's been an attempt to find some way to sort of propose, as John Paul II said, but not to impose so on and so forth. Um, so I, I think this is, we're in a very difficult position. Church is in a difficult position. We're, uh, any of us who believe in the moral law are in a different difficult position. Because people, and the only way out, it seems to me, is to nurture people's, nurture those modes of authority that humanize. Um, and here again, I think the crisis of the family is ground zero for our problems that the primary experience most human beings have of authority that is in, in, in their interests is parental authority, um, you know, or especially paternal authority. And in a society in which fathers are increasingly absent from the lives of their children, how could they learn what it means to have somebody who lays down the law in a way that, uh, because they love you? And not because they want to dominate you. 
Um, or, again, back to my point about subsidiarity, where people join together, they have bylaws for their organization, they establish laws, principles, you know, uh, rules of order together for the sake of advancing what they all want to share in common. And um, so people need to experience uh, law as humanizing, as elevating their, human, their humanity rather than as diminishing them in order for them to be open to the idea that when the church sort of stipulates that certain things are intrinsically evil acts, the church is not trying to limit them, but to provide a basis to empower them to live a more full, fully human life. Yeah. Well, I want to thank, first of all, um, you again, Dr. Reno, for coming, and also Dr. Bradley. And <laughs> this is at least for me, and I know for many of us, a uh, conversation we'd like to have, and we're happy to have it with you. Our next event for Crossroads Cultural Center will be on Friday, April 22nd at 7 p.m. at the Crossroads Auditorium in downtown Manhattan. The title is Fostering Spirituality in the Young. Why is it important? What helps it? What undermines it? Our speakers will be Professor Lisa Miller, Director of Clinical Psychology at the Teachers College in Columbia, at Columbia University, and author of the bestseller The Spiritual Child, and Dr. Holly Peterson, Director of Communication of Communion and Liberation. Thank you again, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.